Good morning, Discovery. I didn't know if I should start singing. My name is Abby. <laughs> and my name is Jamel. And we're so excited to have you guys here this morning. All right, if you have not yet, we do have the connections tables out front. The connection table is where you'll be able to sign in your kids for Discovery Kids today. That will be happening a little bit later on. Also, if you're a little shy, we do have app, we do have social media, and then we also have a web page if you're old school. Um, the Discovery Kids will be exiting out of that door towards uh, my right. And then also too, please remember to pick up your kits. You will have to go out that door to the right as well. Uh, please stand as we begin our gathering from a reading uh, from Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats with them the princes and the princes of his people. He settles the, ch the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Why don't you share a smile with someone next to you? If you already did, do it again. Go ahead and say, I'm so happy you are here today. Welcome. Let's get ready to worship and sing to the Lord.
one more time and say, Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for your love. Thank you, Jesus, for your love. The love that never fails me. Just say one last time. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love. Thank you for your love, oh God. Thank you for your love. about you but there's nothing like the love of God and through my years of experience of just living life on this earth I've realized one thing that people no matter how close they are to you they're always going to fail us because we're imperfect but isn't it amazing that the love of God never does that we can trust Him. We can trust in His love. We can trust in who He is, in His promises, because He's never, ever, ever gonna let us down. So right now, as you just think about that, let's just give thanks to God. Let's just say, God, you're so great. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for everything.
in this place. We understand that there's places in this world that don't have the same freedom that we do to lift up our hands, to sing in a public place, Lord God. So thank you that this morning we have the freedom to say thank you to you, to worship you, and to give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So, Discovery Kids, you guys can go ahead and exit to the door on the right, your left. All right, so to my kids at heart, uh, welcome. Welcome if you not have yet connected at the table located up in the front um, where you are able to fill out a connection card, please do. Um, also, we do have our Discovery uh, Davis uh, website where you can actually get information on all the different things that are going on in our community. And then also too, um, if you have this fun little thing that sometimes can be annoying, uh, is our app, our discovery app that is able to give you the ability to stay connected in active things that are going on in the community. Um, the app is called, it's a new app, it's called uh, Church Center App. Um, it gives you the ability to know different things that are going on as far as our, our different groups that we might have, connecting, you know, different age groups. You know, sometimes you may want to hang out with somebody that likes games and things like that that you met through the church. It's a great way to stay connected. Yeah, speaking of the app, um, our neighborhood communities are starting back up, and that is a great way for you to get involved. Yes, please cheer. Um, so our neighborhood communities, um, as you can see here, they're happening um, in different locations around Davis, and um, just to get involved um, with our community, um, and it's a great way just to form relationships with different people um, in our community. Um, but yeah, you can um, find more out about um, our neighborhood communities either through the app or through the website, um, but it's a great way to get involved. We have um, ones all over Davis, but also we have one specifically, a shout out to our college students, uh, which I'm involved with. Woo! Thank you. Um, and if you want to know any more about that, you are welcome to come talk to me, to Blake, or to either of our interns. Um, and just to uh, transition a little bit, we like to spend some time um, during each of our gatherings to just to think a little bit about generosity. Um, and so uh, we like to give here um, sacrificially and missionally and worshipfully. And it's something that we like to ponder on every single um, gathering and also just throughout our weeks um, individually. Um, and so there are many ways for us to be able to give. You can give through our brand new app. You can also give online. We also have a box out in our lobby for you to be able to give um, if you would like to that way. Um, but I'm going to spend some time just praying over our giving this morning. Father God, um, I just thank you that you ha have given us the opportunity to give um, in whatever way that looks like for us personally. Um, I pray that each of us are able to see the opportunities that you have given us to give, um, that we are able to be perceptive to those throughout our weeks. Um, and I pray that we see all of the different ways that we are able to give, either monetarily or through our time or through um, our just emotions or all of the different ways that you have um, gifted us to be able to give. Um, and I thank you for the, the ways that you have given to us to then be able to give to others. Um, I just pray over our time in this um, gathering this morning that we would be able to receive in all of the, the different ways that um, you have allowed us to. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, hosts. Uh, good morning, friends. Welcome. My name is Steve. I am the lead pastor here at Discovery, and it's good to be together um, as we wrap up September, get ready for October, as UC Davis is back, almost back, fully in session. Um, this is that time of the year, right, where it's hard to find a parking space downtown, and uh, our city just kind of comes alive in a new way. So great to be together this morning. Before we get to uh, our time in Scripture, our teaching time, um, this has been a summer of transition for us. 
uh, here at Discovery. And over the last couple of weeks and for the next few weeks as well, we'll continue to give you some different updates about what all of that looks like. Um, but one of the things we wanted to do today is to celebrate the addition of a new staff team member. So uh, for the last couple of years, our kids' ministry has been um, coordinated by me, uh, which has been fun, and I've really appreciated getting to work with Lisa and Jen and Alex and Danielle. They are awesome, awesome leaders who have done just a brilliant job in relaunching uh, Discovery Kids post-COVID. Um, but I've been kind of the one behind the scenes doing some of the scheduling and logistics and all that sort of stuff, and it is time to pass that on to someone else. And so that someone else is Gabby Reyes. So Gabby, come on up here. And uh, elders and deacons who are in the house, come on and join me up here on stage. Um, Gabby uh, has actually been technically uh, doing this for the last couple of months, um, but also comes to us with a ton of experience in children's ministry. And her role really is as coordinator, kind of taking over the logistics and, you know, the behind the scenes stuff and keeping our team together and running smoothly because... Um, this is really our goal, and we're going to talk more about this in, in the teaching time today, but our, our goal is really to empower people to lead and to use their gifts uh, to serve in a bunch of different ways, one of those being children's ministry. And so, again, for the last two years, Lisa, Danielle, Jen, and Alex have really been dreaming and scheming up some beautiful ways for us to engage our kids in the story of God and the good news of Jesus. And so Gabby is not really like in charge of them per se. She's more coming alongside them and again taking on some of the burden of details that has been on my plate so that uh, that team can continue to function in a really great way so that I can do some other things. Um, and then also so that Gabby can use her gifts to add some things to stuff that's already happening in kids ministry. We're hoping to redo how we do the check-in system. Um, we're looking to add some elements that allow parents to take something home with them each week that they can use to discuss um, as a family with their kids. Hey, what'd you guys learn today? What'd you talk about? Here's what we learned and, and kind of how to initiate those conversations. And then you know if you've been around for a while that we do uh, about once a month a thing called family worship. And we are looking for more ways to incorporate our kids into the, the larger life of our church and those family worship Sundays um, beyond just like hey, here's, here's a piece of paper, color it so that, you know, you don't go crazy while Steve is talking, right? Um, so Gabby's going to help lead forward some of those efforts, and we're really grateful that you're here and that you're a part of the team and that you're joining us in this way. Um, and it, one last thing in addition to this is just to say that uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this after the gathering. So parents, when you go over to pick up your kids, uh, you'll join Gabby and I over there for maybe five to seven minutes. We'll try to keep it as brief as possible, but um, we'll say a lot of similar things and then just a couple of other uh, bits of information and also celebrate our current team as well. So if you can join me after the gathering, that would be awesome. All right, if you're able, I want to just invite you to uh, extend your hands out in prayer. Um, hey, Darren, do you want to pray for Gabby? Sure. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Um, let's pray together as we uh, celebrate Gabby coming onto the team. God, just thank you so much for, for Gabby and her heart and her gifts for, for organizing, for coordinating, for uh, just really empowering the, the team of people who are serving the children of this church, God. Thank you for her, for her vision and her humility uh, and, and her wisdom, God. Uh, we just ask that as she goes into this position, God, that um, she just is able to feel um, supported by you, God, by the team, and is able to work together to create something uh, even more beautiful than what's already there, God. Um, and we also uh, would just want to uh, um, give, give her, God, just an extra measure of, of patience, God, an extra measure of discernment, an extra measure of creativity, God, uh, an extra measure of strength, uh, as we know, God, that uh, coordinating, leading, God, uh, is not easy. And so we just thank you for her willingness to step into this role, and we're grateful for her heart and her soul, God, and the person that you've made her to be, and how she can bless uh, our volunteers and bless our, our leaders and bless 
our church and our children, God. Uh, we thank you for all that you've given us and that uh, you've given us uh, Gabby to use her gifts in this way, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Give Gabby one more hand. Thank you, guys. And then as they make their way off stage, I want to invite you to meet me in Matthew chapter 20. If you have a, a physical Bible, it's about 80% of the way through. Um, follow along on your phone or on the screen as well. But Matthew 20 is where we are today as we continue our conversation uh, that we are calling Good Neighbors. And before we read the text, one more uh, just one more sort of announcement, housekeeping thing. Um, we introduced last week Justin Keneshoff as our, uh, as our current elder candidate, hopefully the next person to join our elder team. Justin's at the sound booth um, today. Justin, you can wave. There it is. A little wave. Um, and so how this works here at Discovery is we have people go through a period of training and discernment um, that happened this spring. Four different people were a part of that experience um, with our current elder team. And Justin's the first one to kind of be up. Our hope is to sort of stagger people um, as we move forward. And um, what we do at this point in the process is introduce them to you, to the congregation, and then open it up for feedback. Do you have questions, thoughts, affirmations, concerns about Justin's candidacy or about the process in general, and we're happy to answer those to the best of our ability. Um, and then the hope is that there's a, there's a consensus that, yes, we're excited about Justin being an elder for this community, and then we would uh, commission him, and he would start his term. Our elders do three-year terms and then have an opportunity to either take a break or do another term. After that second term, they are forced to take a break, according to our rules and bylaws. Um, and, uh, and then at some point in the future can come back, which is actually what Justin is doing. He has elded at Discovery before, and it's pretty cool to see him come back um, in this capacity. So uh, again, uh, you can send emails, questions. You can either talk to us in person. Always is a great idea. But if you want to send an email, <coughs> it's elders at discoverydavis.org. All right, Matthew chapter 20. This is actually a text that we uh, looked at not too long ago, but in the Gospel of Mark. Remember we did a uh, 16, 17 week journey through the Gospel of Mark here recently. And so this will sound maybe a little familiar if you've been around, but also hopefully we're coming at it in a fresh way this morning. Mark chapter 20, beginning in verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. What is it you want? Jesus asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the other ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. And so Jesus calls them together and, and kind of rallies the team. He says to them, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. This is one of the most pointed statements that Jesus makes in the Gospels. Okay? Not so with you. Instead, instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we celebrate what you are doing. Uh, 
in our larger community here in Davis, the beginning of a new academic year, a new season. We celebrate what you're doing here at Discovery. We continue, God, to ask for the eyes to see. For the eyes to see where you are already working and for the courage to join you there. This morning, would you lead us deeper into this conversation about being good neighbors? What it looks like for us to love you with everything we've got. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love and serve each other as ourselves. We pray all this this morning in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. All right. I love a good two-by-two two chart almost as much as I love a good Venn diagram. All right, so here's our two-by-two two chart this morning. This is a tool that we actually use in our discipleship process, in our leadership development process here at Discovery. You'll see the two, the two axes. Yes? Somebody who knows math? Uh, high support, high challenge, low support, low challenge. So we have an axis of challenge and an axis of support. What oftentimes happens in spaces where discipleship is reduced to attendance at events, you end up with a low challenge, low support environment, you end up with bored disciples. All right. Now, on the other kind of side of all of that is where we want to be. This is the kind of culture that we want to build that I think we are building and are continuing to learn how to do better. But we want to be a community of high support and high challenge. Now, on the, the other spaces, right, where we kind of go too far in one direction or another. And in, in low challenge, high support environments, we create this very cozy space. On the other side of the spectrum, if it's all challenge and no support, people are stressed out. And I have to confess that as a leader, I find that I want to empower people, but I can sometimes swing back and forth from cozy to stressed out. Right? I, I want to make it easy, like lower the bar, uh, make it comfortable for people to be here and to serve. And so give them tons of support, but not a lot of challenge. And, and then I just sort of hope that like, oh, maybe they'll figure out that there's like some things that you should do. Right? Like maybe they'll just sort of kind of intuit that on their own. And then, then that doesn't happen. So it's like, oh, okay, so here's some challenge. Here's some things that you should do. And then people end up in this place of, ooh, I feel really stressed out. But the goal, of course, the goal is to get into this place of high support and high challenge. The goal, the goal is to empower people. Right? The goal is to empower people. Irenaeus says, the glory of God is a human being fully alive, empowered to love God with everything they have and to love their neighbors as themselves. And again, this is the task this fall. This is the, the sort of thing behind the thing in this series that we're calling Good Neighbors. And this is also a theme that we will continue to build on as we move into other conversations throughout the year. What does it look like for us to take Jesus' command seriously, right? To love God and to love others. So a quick Quick recap of where we've been. Week one, we looked at love over fear, right? Good neighbors follow Jesus by receiving God's love and sharing that love with others, even if it opens us up to some hard stuff, right? Even if it opens us up to rejection, to being misunderstood. Even if choosing love means that we have to face our fears, Week two, last week, we looked at truth over lies, right? Good neighbors follow Jesus by serving. God is a servant and we are most like God when we serve. And we looked at a couple of lies that sometimes come in, can creep into this conversation. Right, the lie that you have to be spiritually elite. Right, that good neighboring is sort of for people who have leveled up or who have reached some sort of enlightened place. And, and Jesus uh, we looked at the, the story of the Good Samaritan, right? Jesus kind of dismantles that thinking, right? You do not need to be in the spiritually elite to be a good neighbor. And then the other lie that we looked at is this idea that sometimes we feel like it's all up to us, right? We have to work really hard, do a bunch of stuff, start a ministry, whatever it might be, whatever the craziest thing is. And the truth is God 
is already out in front of us, right? God is a servant, and so we are simply following his lead. Now, this week we're looking at empowerment over coercion. Good neighbors follow Jesus by empowering others. So, to the text, to Matthew chapter 20, I want us to actually back up to Matthew chapter 19. So if you have your Bible, just flip over one page. Because there's a series of events that lead to this moment where James and John send their mom to ask Jesus for these positions of authority. There's this series of events that leads to this moment that, that I think makes it even more interesting and rich when you see the full context. So back in chapter 19, Jesus encounters a young man. Okay, you want to talk about a high challenge situation. Here you go. Jesus encounters a young man, he's sometimes referred to as the rich young ruler, who asks a very similar question to the expert in the law that we saw last week in Luke chapter 10. He comes to Jesus and he says, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Right, we unpacked that, that phrase, eternal life, a bit last Sunday. Just a quick reminder, in the Greek, it is the words zoe aeneas which literally translates to age of life. In our English Bibles, we often translate it eternal life. Recall that this question that is being asked here is less about how do I get into heaven. It's less a question of quantity of life. And it has far more to do with a quality of life. What does the good life look like? And, and certainly there's, there's eternal implications here for sure. But in that time, in that context, this was a question about how do I live a good life right here and right now? And so Jesus says, again, high challenge, sell all of your stuff and give the proceeds to the poor. And then come follow me, high support. We're told in the story that this young man leaves sad don't actually know what he does. The assumption here is that this is too big of a challenge. He's stressed out. Maybe more importantly, it also stresses out the disciples who are like, wait a minute, what, what's going on here? If this guy can't lead the good life, if this guy cannot experience Zoe Ionios, then who can? Who can? If the rich are not blessed, if they're not living the good life, then who, who can? And Jesus says, you know what? Life in my kingdom is going to be a challenge for the rich. And you can almost like, as you read through the story, you can almost feel the like brain calculations happening in the disciples. And Peter starts to go, hey, but wait a minute. But we like, but we did that. We left everything, right? That's good, right? And Jesus says, yeah. Yeah, because not only that, look at all that you get to experience as a result of this. Now, there's way more to this than how much money is in your bank account. You'll know this eternal kind of life. You will have influence. You will experience deep community. And you will have an adventure to pursue together. And then the conclusion to all of this is this very weird statement. And so, by the way, the last will be first and the first will be last. Right after this, so now we're in the beginning of chapter 20, Jesus launches into a very controversial story comparing the kingdom of God to a vineyard. The landowner, the vineyard owner, hires workers throughout the day. Everybody is working different amounts of time. Some people eight or nine hours, some people two or three hours. And then at the end of the day, they all line up to get paid. And, and you know, they're expecting to get their their you know, whatever their wages were for the amount of time that they worked, and the landowner pays everybody the exact same amount of money. Right? And the people who had worked eight hours are looking at the people who worked two hours and are like, wait a minute, how is this? This is not fair. Everybody got paid the same amount. All the Americans booed. That's not how it's supposed to work. Now, this is, there, there may be some interesting economic implications. This is not a parable about economics. It's a story telling us something about God. It's a story telling us something about God. And I think the key part of the story comes in verse 15. 
where the landowner, the vineyard owner, who is the God character in the story, asked the question, actually asked two questions. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? Right, we just took a moment to reflect on God's generosity. Here it is again. Are you envious because I am generous? And then Jesus repeats for the second time, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Then there's this little sort of uh, side note, but not really a, a side note. It's a main part of the story. For the third time, Jesus then predicts his death. This is how this is going to go. We're headed to Jerusalem. I'll be put on trial. I will die three days later. I will rise again. So what is going on? What is going on here? We have... A real life encounter with a rich young man. We have this story, this parable about this unfair vineyard owner. In both cases, Jesus wants his followers, both the, the literal 12 disciples who were following him around at that time, but also us to see that his kingdom operates from this very different place. Right? The kingdom of God operates in a completely different way than the way that kingdoms normally operate. It is not a kingdom of fairness. It is not about earning or getting what we deserve. It is not a kingdom that is built on the normal power structures. It's not a kingdom that's built on, uh, you know, doing church the right way and, and quote unquote good spirituality. It is upside down. It is a relational kingdom. And it's way more about how we love people than about how well we follow the rules. It's a kingdom of abundance. Right? There's more than enough. Our king is generous. And it's an upside down kingdom. The first will be last. The last will be first authority. Is about power given away. Leadership is about serving. And I think underneath all of this, when you think about the rich young man and the disciples and the questions that they're wrestling with and this parable about the vineyard owner, again, all leading up to this encounter with James and John, when you think about all of this, the question here is about trust. Who or what do we trust? Do we trust our ability to earn? Do we trust our ability to perform? Do we trust that there is enough? Do we live in a scarcity kingdom or do we live in this kingdom of abundance? Do we trust King Jesus and his grace, his love, his generosity? Do we trust Jesus enough to follow him even if that means following him down to last place? And so we get to now uh, Matthew 20, verse 20, and the, the disciples reveal immediately that they are still struggling with this, right? <laughs> James and John send their mom to make sure they get the team captain position. As someone who's uh, very involved in youth sports, this still happens all the time. <laughs> hey, we want the best seats. We want right and left hand. We want the the most prestigious, most important, most elevated positions on your team. This, of course, is a request that ticks everybody else off. In the middle there, Jesus assures them, you, you have no idea what you're doing here, right? You do not understand what it is that you're asking. And they have this weird conversation about cups. Can you drink this cup? And they say, of course we can. This is really a conversation about death. Are you willing to die? Oh, yeah. No, you're not. We have here a prime example of the phenomenon that we've been naming all month about how our preferences oftentimes become more important than Jesus' ways, right? We've said healthy, biblical, theological reflection begins with Jesus, who gives us a mission, who then organizes us into churches to accomplish that mission. The fancy words here, I'm going to get, get you know, theologian for just a moment. The fancy words here are Christology, Missology, Ecclesiology. 
Again, our contention is we begin with Christology, Jesus, who gives us a mission, who organizes us into churches to accomplish that, that mission. Jesus, mission, church. Oftentimes, though, we begin the other way around with church and our preferences and where's my seat and am I at the right and the left hand. And then maybe we, you know, figure out how to kind of get Jesus to sponsor that idea. And then if we're really spiritual, we'll invite some people. This is our mission. Right? We'll invite some people to our thing. Jesus, mission, church. James and John, awesome examples of how we can get this mixed up. They want the church of James and John. Not the church of Jesus. They want the church where their preferences win. And so Jesus has to lovingly redirect high support, but also high challenge. You know. You know how it normally works, right? You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servants. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. To give his life as a ransom for many. Greatness in the kingdom of God is servanthood. Leadership in the kingdom of God is serving. The top of the flow chart is actually the bottom of the flow chart. Right? Our elders eld because they lead us in serving. Uh, oftentimes on Sunday morning, you'll find me uh, making coffee in the lobby. And I get in trouble because people are like, you're not supposed to do that. Someone else should be doing that. And I get that. There's definitely, I think, a word of challenge there for me, right? So I'm supposed to be empowering other people to do these things. But I also believe, this is one of my deepest convictions, if the lead pastor of a church is not willing to make coffee or roll out the bins or vacuum the auditorium or whatever it may be, it's not actually the church of Jesus. It's the church of James and John or whoever the name of the pastor is. Greatness flows from servanthood. Greatness flows from servanthood. And growth, growth as a good neighbor comes from from participating in this. Participation and servanthood, it goes together. Oftentimes we get very focused on the result, the outcome. What, is, what do I get out of this? What, what place does it get me? How does this help? You know, give me the measurables. And some of those questions are really good questions. But one of the things that we are after is participation. Like be a part of this. Experience this. Serve. Right? Participate in the mission and see what happens. I mentioned that I'm, I'm involved in youth sports right now. I'm coaching my son's soccer team. When we practice, when we have a practice, these eight and nine year old boys do not show up with notebooks to sit there for an hour and listen to me lecture on soccer, which I could do. And I'd probably enjoy it at some level. But well, that, that's not how they learn the game, right? How do they learn the game? They learn the game by doing the drills and, and, and by practicing and scrimmaging. And they learn by playing the game, right? I have a kid on my team, Noah, who is your classic, like, um, hey, look, a bird kid. Every team has one. They're a blessing. And, uh, and, and so Noah, um, I had him, this was, this was our game last week, I had him for the first time play striker. And if you're familiar with soccer, this is like the person who's sort of at the, the tip of the pyramid whose who's, uh, main role is to try to score goals. So I'm like, Noah, you're striker. And he looks at me and his eyes get really big and he's like, Coach, I've never scored a goal before. 
And this might have been a this might have been a dumb idea or response, but I was like, today's the day, Noah. Today's the day. So he gets out there, and it was probably the best, like, 10 minutes that I've ever seen him play. He was totally engaged. He was into it. And there comes a moment towards the end of his shift at striker where he gets the ball right in the box, right at his feet. He turns, and it's just this beautiful shot. It's one of those, like, rising shots. It's headed towards the, the like, top right corner. And I'm like, this is it. I'm running down the field. I'm, like, about to rip my shirt off and kick the corner post down. And celebrate. I'm like, this is the moment where he falls in love with soccer. And then he's going to become a pro. And there will be a movie. And Chris Evans will play me in the movie. And it's going to be amazing. You like that, right, Chris Evans? <clears throat> anyway, the shot is, I'm thinking all this. All these thoughts are going through my head as this ball is in the air. And this ball hits the post and it bounces out. And I'm like, dead. Oh. I, I wanted that goal so bad. It had nothing to do with the score of the game. I wanted that so bad for Noah. And he just, you know, keeps playing and has a great time. And after the game, he comes up to me and he says, Coach, that's the most fun I've ever had playing soccer. Oh. <laughs> because it wasn't about the result. Right? It was about playing the game. It was about being in it. And in the kingdom of God, you are playing the game. You are in it when you are serving. Are you with me? You want to grow as a follower of Jesus. Serve people. You want to deepen your faith. Share your faith with someone. You want to, you want to pray more. You want to have a more robust prayer life. Start good neighboring just on your street. You will have plenty of things to talk to God about. Participate. Play the game. I know this is true because it's been the story of my life. My biggest growth has always come from playing the game. I'd much rather go read a book. Even though it's, it's messier and harder, the, the growth comes from playing the game. I'm going to quote Darren who was just up here praying a moment ago. We don't get it together and then serve. We get it together because we serve. And that's the whole thing right there. We don't get it together and then serve. We get it together because we serve. And you can, you can replace serve with good neighbor if you would like. If you still have your Bible open, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to land the plane here. In Ephesians chapter 4, the writer Paul has, has spent the first three chapters of this letter talking about the, the church in Ephesus, their identity in Christ, who they are now because of what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection. And then in chapter 4, he turns the corner to more practical issues. And so we're going to take a quick look at something he says right in the middle of that chapter. Again, very practical stuff and how they are to function as a church. I want you to pay attention to the language here. There's a couple of things that he repeats multiple times. Beginning in verse 11, Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. Right, to help these people get in the game, to play the game. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. If you were with us last Sunday or if you go back and listen to that teaching, that the fullness should ring some bells. Then at this point, we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will high support, high challenge, right? Do you hear it? Speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up into love as each part does its work. Maturity equals servanthood. 
because God is a servant. Now within this, Paul, again, the writer of this letter, lists five types of gifts that help create empowerment environments. Five types of gifts that help create empowerment environments. This is sometimes referred to as a past, which is an unfortunate title. Want to be a pest? Come serve at church, right? This is simply an acronym for these five environments. Again, high support, high challenge, where we are uniquely gifted by the Spirit of God to help people mature and be equipped to serve, right? To get in the game. Very briefly, I'll just tell you a little bit about each one and then offer you an invitation and a challenge. Apostles help create an activating environment. These are the people who are constantly thinking of new ideas. Let's start a coffee shop. Let's do a new ministry. Let's go to this place where there isn't anything going on. If you're that kind of person who's like creative, ideation, uh, uh, let's go see what God is already doing. Let's join God at work. You might be an apostle. Prophets create a liberating environment. Prophets call us to remember the oppressed, to remember God's call to do justice. They call us to remember God. By the way, this is me, which is why about 20% of the time when I'm preaching on Sunday morning, you feel annoyed. Because prophets are the most annoying of the five types. <laughs> Evangelists. Evangelists create a welcoming environment. You are thinking about how spiritual explorers will hear or experience things in our community. How can we make this uh, more obvious, intuitive, uh, easier to use? How, how can we get people to uh, figure out how to get through the maze of construction that's happening you know, out in front of the theater? All those sorts of things. That is the evangelist gift. Shepherds or pastors, it, you know, it can go, that, that word is translated the same uh, from the Greek. Shepherds create a healing environment. They care for people, they listen to people, they help people process and heal in community. And then teachers help create a learning environment, right? They, they're saying, hey, let's dig in, let's ask some questions, let's study, here's a book to read. A learning environment. We need all of them. And we need all of them. Each of these environments contributes to a healthy, flourishing community where people are empowered to get in the game. To be good neighbors in their own unique way. And so my invitation and challenge to you is to take, there's a whole like assessment that goes along with the APES. And so if you are interested in that, if you would like to do that, Send me an email, I will send you the link, and then Antonio will meet with you and talk about it. Actually, I'm, I'm making both of us available. We, if there's 100 of you that want to do this, we'll do 100 meetings. All right, because we believe so much in, in the ability of this uh, uh, truth in Scripture, right, to create these environments where people are empowered to serve and to be in the game in their area of gifting. So if you would like to do this, Send us an email, we'll send you a link, we'll set up a time to talk about it and go through it together. Now as we get ready for communion, I'll invite the band to come back. They're going to lead us in a couple of songs as we take communion together. Our prayer team, by the way, will also be available on either side of the theater here if you would like to pray with someone today. But as we come to the table, uh, let us return to Matthew 20 and to Jesus' words. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel. Right? This is the good news of Jesus. That as we come to the table and we take these elements that represent his body broken for us, his blood spilled for us, we come with the assurance that Jesus has gone first in all of this. Right? We come to the table to remember and celebrate that he is our leader, our savior, our teacher, our king of this upside down kingdom. And not from a position of 
you know, removed authority from up on high, but from a position of being in it with us, again, of going first, of giving his life as a ransom for many. We don't follow Jesus for many. We don't follow Jesus because he's got some nice ideas. In his way. We follow him in his ways because he has demonstrated it, because he has demonstrated it very clearly for his life, his death, and his resurrection. Right? He did this for us. He did this for us. respond in worship, to respond in worship, to respond in service, to respond in service, to respond in being a part, to respond in being a part with the game with him. Let me pray. And then when you're let me pray. And then when you're ready as we sing these closing songs, you can come to the table and take communion. And take communion. Heavenly Father. and all that that means. Zoe Ioannias, now and into eternity. Right relationship with you and each other, now and into eternity. And so God, would you soften our hearts to receive the gift this morning, the good news. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the thousandth time, whatever it may be, would it be fresh and new and real for us as we come to the table this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Sunday mornings as a benediction, sort of a call to mission, right? This invitation to participate, to play the game. Now, may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace and peace, friends.